New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. Listen to your heart, not to private phone calls, but first, there will be no recovery. James, I'm going to run down a few different headlines showing just what's going on in the economy, what check is in the mail, and who's getting pink slips, and then I'll throw it to you after we blast through these different headlines. So the first I'll take from MSN, large pension fund files plan to cut retiree benefits under new law. Nearly 300,000 former truckers and their families would suffer significant losses under a proposal that uses a controversial new law to cut once sacrosanct pension benefits. The huge Central States Pension Fund, which administers retirement benefits to some former and current Teamster truckers, said the reductions are the only way to save the plan from insolvency. Headline number two from Bloomberg, it's deadline time at Morgan Stanley to keep your right to sue. Morgan Stanley is asking employees to give up their right to sue the firm in class actions for civil rights violations, including discrimination based on race, gender, or age. This according to one former employee's lawsuit. So interesting things going on. James, here's another one really hot off the presses from just an hour or two ago. Deutsche Bank warns of $7 billion in loss and their stock immediately plummets 6%. Going along right with that, third quarter earnings bloodbath continues with terrible Monsanto results. Company fires 2600 as it boosts its buyback, trying to, you know, shore up its bottom line. But a really interesting note, and workers are biting back, and these were stunning photos. Air France executives have clothes ripped off by angry workers facing layoffs. And we got the link to LibertyNews.com. Clearly the news that some 300 cockpit crew, 900 flight attendants, and 1,700 ground crew would shortly be unemployed did not fall on welcoming ears. James, I think all these bits together tell a pretty sad tale. So what do you see coming next? Well, I think it's important to understand that this is all part and parcel of what I think is really the second or even the third wave of the economic collapse of 2008, which is still occurring in stages. And it's been papered over by the flood of liquidity from the quantitative easing. But now that there's quantitative tightening going on in all of the emerging market economies and all around the world where the dollars are now flooding back towards the U.S. empire, the dollar is gaining strength. But that's not actually a good thing for the, uh, the health of the global economy. So we're starting to see uh, the effects of that and of course the abysmal jobs numbers in September even by the crooked and phony and fake uh, you know official unemployment numbers and what have you but let alone the actual uh, labor participation rate I mean it's it's definitely there's no doubt that the recovery is showing itself for what it is right now and it's really starting to affect things like this pension fund like the uh, the earnings reports from Q3. I think we're starting to see really a, a huge shift in the the sort of you know heroin fix economy that we've been living in the last several years that has been keeping people dazed and confused. Now I think the Air France story is illuminating because I think that represents what is coming along next in the next stage of the crisis. And it's interesting, no matter where you go on the web to read about that story, the comments are invariably something about, oh, the French are getting soft. They used to chop off people's heads, but now they're just ripping off their clothes or what have you. It's all lighthearted. But there is something to this. I mean, we know that economic hardships uh, really do cause revolutions. But we also know from the French Revolution that revolution does not necessarily make anything better better fundamentally. It's just a change in the game, but it's often the same players or the same groups controlling the game at the top. So again, revolution is a very, very risky business, and it certainly does not mean everything is going to be sunshine and rainbows on the other side. So we have to be very careful about this and the way that, uh, that we go about this. And as I've always said, I think the only real solution is to start engineering the alternative economy with alternative currencies and alternative uh, ways of transacting and uh, agorism, ways of getting around the system so that we don't have to interact with their system at all. And it, that hap that's a thing that happens in stages and process, and it happens over a very long time, and we have to do it carefully. But there's no other alternative really in this rigged and phony game that we're starting to see unravel right now. James, a, a couple of other economic notes. I've been following the American apparel bankruptcy story, which I think is really interesting on a number of levels. The Los Angeles Times, which in some ways has a, has a stake in this because they're based in Southern California, they've got a pretty good article that kind of breaks down what's going on. They filed for bankruptcy Monday, but they've been in trouble for the over the course of many years. American apparel hangs on to its made-in-USA ideal by a thread. And the article, while telling you pretty much 
the ups and downs of it, has a bunch of financial guys basically saying, stupid Made in America model, I, they're never going to make it with that. Anyway, the one that hits much closer to home, which would pretty much be at our home where we live, rents rise nearly 20% in an apartment owned by the city of Portland as rent here has gone insane over the last few years. And I think all of these changes we'll start to see really kick in. As I almost wonder if we're in for a sort of nomadic future. But we'll leave that aside for the moment, James, and move to our second story. This week should be the shot heard around the world, but we'll see. We've warned about it for almost two years on this show, as recently as June of 2015 and back to November 2013. It's the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Now, there's a ton of bad in this mostly secret deal, and Corbett's got a good rundown on the big picture in his latest International Forecaster article. But let's focus on just one angle that I think is kind of germane to this show, and it's kind of the reason we're all here in some ways. The TPP could kill the internet. This from CommonDreams.org. The disastrous pro-corporate trade deal finalized Monday could kill the net as we know it, campaigners are warning, as they vow to keep up the fight against the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, the agreement between the U.S. and 11 Pacific Rim nations. Internet users around the world should be very concerned about this ultra-secret pact. What we're talking about here is a global internet censorship. It will criminalize our online activities, censor the web, and cost everyday users money. This deal would never pass with the whole world watching, which is why they've negotiated it in total secrecy, said Open Media's digital rights specialist Megan Sully. TPP opponents have claimed that under the agreement, internet service providers could be required to police user activity, i.e. police you and I, take down internet con content and cut people off from internet access for common user-generated content. Among the deal's provisions are rules that could criminalize file sharing, whistleblowing, breaking digital locks, even for legitimate purposes. Of course, because the contents of the pact have been negotiated largely in secret, the exact implications of the TPP on user rights is yet to be seen. The EFF said, the Electronic Frontier Foundation said, we have no reason to believe that the TPP has improved much at all from the last leaked version released in August, and we won't know until the U.S. Trade Representative releases the text. So as long as it contains a retroactive 20-year copyright term extension, bans on circumventing DRM, massively disproportionate punishments for copyright infringement, and rules that criminalize investigative journalists and whistleblowers, we have to do everything we can to stop this agreement from getting signed, ratified, and put into force. James, I, I mentioned the article you've written, the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations are finished. Here's what you need to know. And you run down kind of the big picture points, as I noted, but I think something else that you point out, all the strange characters who have now come out against it, in some cases they've flip-flopped against it, but the CFR loves it. So how screwed are we? Well, that's, that's really the key question here. Huh. And unfortunately, it's one that we can't really answer definitively w until we actually get to read the text, because all we have now are leaked, ver leaked drafts of a few of the chapters of this 30-chapter document. Um, so we have some idea of some of the things that are in here, but we don't know the final form of it. We have some vague reporting that's come out of some of the negotiations and what people have been willing to say on record. But again, all of that's meaningless until we can actually read what's actually in the deal, and we can't do that yet. Now, interestingly, I've seen some different time frames about what's going on here and what the next step is. And from the U.S. side of it, the U.S. Trade Representative, yes, is supposed to release the text. And here's my understanding of it. Uh, the uh, Obama can't sign the text until the public has been given 90 days to review it. So apparently this deal has to be made public in the coming days or weeks, and then it will be signed in January or some point at that at that point, and then it'll go to Congress uh, for implementation through legislation, and then it'll finally be signed. So we're looking till into even mid next year before this could actually be signed as a done deal in the U.S. Congress. But then you've got independent.co.uk with this headline from just the other day, TPP trade agreement text won't be made public for four years. And I think this reporting is flawed. I think it's BS, but, uh, but I, again, I don't know. There, I've seen so many different sources on this that it's difficult to know. But we have to be able to read the text to, to understand what's in it, obviously. Um, and, you know, Nancy Pelosi can remind us of that. So, uh, so yes, we don't know specifically what has how bad this deal is, but we know 
it's going to be bad. We know that they've standardized on towards U.S. copyright laws, you know, extending the Disney copyright laws around the world with uh, Death of the Author plus 70 years and all of that monstrosity. And all of those other things, the internet uh, infringements uh, and all, all, all those other deals and all those other industries, dairy farmers in Canada and uh, automakers in Japan, and everyone has something to hate in this deal, which is why we see so much opposition from su- such a wide diversity of uh, people on the on the phony spectrum, on the real political spectrum, everywhere we've got dissent, except for the CFR and all of these mouthpieces of power. So make of that what you will, which is, this is a bad deal. The only question is how bad. We have to continue to scrutinize it, and there is still a chance that it won't get passed. There's elections coming up in the U.S. next year. There's an election going on in Canada right now, an election cycle, and the opposition party has already said they will not be bound by the terms of this deal, so... Who knows? We'll see. But there's still a chance that this won't be ratified in the end. I, I wonder, worry, or speculate, with the, given the amount of time and given the elections coming up and given that now you know, Hillary's flip-flopped and said she's against it because Trump and Sanders, they're against it too. I wonder if we'll see a little bit of don't throw me in the briar patch kind of back and forth over the next several months to where, oh, there's been such an outcry. Well, I guess we'll water it down a little bit. You guys won. You beat us. And it'll pretty much go on like it was. That's that's my fear and speculation. My other note, James, just from a phony left-right paradigm here in the States, isn't it funny how the fake right are supposed to be those big business bastards but from what I can tell in my life, it's always been the Democrats who pass these huge trade agreements that destroy everything. I don't know. Just a little bit of paying attention from being around for a few years. But let's turn our eyes to the skies in a good way for our third and final story this week on New World Next Week, episode 244, as we've been giving hashtag good news next week every week all through 2015. And this is a great one. Activists airdrop flyers on an NSA base urging agents to quit their jobs. Let's take it from the antimedia.org. Dateline, Darmstadt, Germany. Last Friday, October 2nd, a drone-like device dropped flyers over a key NSA Intel facility that advised employees to quit their jobs on ethical grounds. The effort is the most recent attempt by privacy advocates to chip away at the power of the surveillance state using direct action campaigns. Ping, a tactical media and activist group, and also Kraftwerk Lyric, used a remote-controlled plane to drop flyers over a U.S. military base in Germany that serves as the NSA's European hub of signals intelligence, known as the Dagger Complex. The flyers were designed by Intel Exit, the specific campaign Ping launched to encourage security agency employees to quit their jobs. A video posted to YouTube shows footage from the remote-controlled plane intercut with panoramic shots of it flying overhead. If the group's past efforts are any indication, the flyers likely appeal to security agency employees' sense of morality. Last week, Ping and Intel Exit launched a billboard advertising campaign near the NSA's Fort Meade headquarters in Maryland. The GCHQ, a government communication headquarters, the UK's spy agency facility, and the Dagger Complex in Darmstadt, Germany. Outside the Dagger Complex, James, a billboard reads, listen to your heart, not to private phone calls. Outside the GCHQ headquarters in Cheltenham, an ad quips that the intelligence community needs a backdoor. And one sign attached to a van that circled Fort Meade last week read, hoped to serve your people, ended up spying on them, exit intelligence. Friday's airdropped flyers constitute another tactic of Ping and Intel Exit's campaign to reach employees who may have serious reservations about their careers. Quote, we know for a fact that there are many, many people working there who are conflicted, anxious, and ultimately completely against what these agencies are doing, end quote, said Ariel Fisher, a pseudonymous spokesperson for Intel Exit. They've also got info in there from folks like Thomas Drake, And James, I know you've reported about folks like Thomas Drake and all the other whistleblowers that have been telling us about the spying for decades, James. Yes, and then, of course, the mainstream media only hypes the snow job to try to distract us from all of that. Well, I like the idea of this. I mean, I think the drone drop is more of kind of a 
a, a photo op for this group rather than something that's probably going to yield any results. But the idea of this, I think, is the right idea because at, at least at this point, so far at this point, it's not robots that are manning these uh, these spying systems, uh, you know, completely. There is still the human element to it, and the human element does have that moral side that can be appealed to. And I think it's important to do so, whether we talk about the NSA or the the out of control U.S. military or whatever it is. There are still humans in positions that can actually affect things and they can be appealed to uh, for their humanity. So I like the idea of this uh, and I think it should be something that we can take and run with in a lot of different ways from a lot of different perspectives. This is just one, uh, I think, particularly visually uh, interesting one. So I hope people will check out the video. And I think it, and just like what actually when I told Cassie about it and mentioned the story, because anyone's first thought is, are you allowed to do that? Can you fly something over that bay? Like it gets you interested in going, how could you even do that? So I think as, as you're kind of saying as, as a, as a stunt, that's, that's exactly what it was. I think, I think it was successful. There's a ton of other great hashtag good news next week stories this week. And I'll mention just a few for you. BP to pay nearly $21 billion to settle the world's largest oil spill. Europe's top court strikes down safe Harbor data transfer agreement with the U S and this is one I missed from Good News next week, last week, but I love this one. A van in New Mexico picks up panhandlers and pays them $9 an hour for work that needs to be done. Another one I really enjoy, James. West Point and Harvard debate teams lose to the New York prison inmates debate team. U.S. troops may file lawsuit against the Syrian war. Almost 6,000 federal drug war inmates to be released. And one good news next week update to one of our main stories from last week. Free Speech 1, authoritarian cultural Marxist 0, UN Broadband Commission pulls the cyber violence report. That, of course, in reference to the You Suck, You're a Liar report that we covered last week. And one last good news next week. Note, James, I'm excited to announce a spinoff series. I'm going to turn good news next week into its own regular series starting in 2016. At the latest, I would say. And of course, there's always the classic hashtag New World Next Week for all the other major stories we're all following, you know, blowing up hospitals, watching out for World War III. But I'll only mention one, but I think it's a really good one, James, that illustrates, I think, what we try and do here as we wrap up this episode 244. A good year after the alternative media covered this and other kind of similar stories, the mainstream media is finally asking the musical question, how did ISIS get so many Toyotas? And that is an interesting one, and that should be another question. When you hear that headline, you should go, hey, yeah, how did they get all those Toyotas? And with that, James, I'll close on a deep programming note. No New World next week. Next week, as I'll be traveling, but we should return the following week with episode 245. All right, and let me just throw in an adjunct to that uh, final New World Next Week update. Uh, I'll just uh, mention at Brock West's tweet about uh, the U.S., uh, uh, symbol on the tents in the ISIS training video, which I thought was uh, particularly apt. All right, and good to hear about the good news next week. We need more of that. I'd love to see more positivity and more of those types of stories in the alt media generally, so I'm glad you're going to be stepping into the ring and taking on that mantle 